Well, good morning. It is uh, 6.30, and it was a lovely 34 degrees on my way in this morning, so nice and chilly. Winter has finally come to Rough Acres. Uh, let me get this set up. We're back in our series on 2 Peter, and today's message is called Wholesome Thoughts. Wholesome Thoughts. It makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside, doesn't it? Um, 2 Peter is a manual for transformation. And it's a guide for how to do how to do good holy living. So it began, remember, it began with a promise that in Christ we have all we need for life and godliness. Through Christ we can participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of life caused by our sinful desires. So that's how it all began. And so he's kind of winding it down. We've got this week and next week in 2 Peter, then we're done. So Let's look at, at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. Wholesome thinking. The first battle for holiness takes place between your ears. You've got to decide that you want to win the battle by learning to think right. Now, Wholesome thinking is not what we would call positive thinking. The, fra the phrase that, that uh, Peter uses here, it's a phrase that a lot of writers, even Plato, um, said it literally means pure reason. So this is now my second letter. I've written to both of them as reminders to stimulate you to thinking in pure reason, not being seduced by our senses. Not being swayed by whether we're happy today or sad today or mad at somebody today. When Peter is referring to wholesome thinking, he's not talking about Pollyannaism. Pollyannaism? 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 Being a Pollyanna. He's not saying we should pretend it's still the 1950s and leave it to Beaver. He's saying that we need to have accurate thinking. Seeing the world objectively as it really is, not subjectively as our emotions might dictate. Now, there's a lot of people that are ruled by their emotions. And they always, if you're ruled by your emotions, if everything in your emotions is what it takes, is what you, is what you gauge your life by, you're going to ride a roller coaster every day. Up, down, up, down, up, down. Why? Because your emotions lie to you. Norman Vincent Peale said this years ago, he said, change your thoughts and change your world. Quote, change your thoughts, change your world. If we change the way we think, we'll do right. If we, if we want to live in this world the way God intended us to live, then we should have these wholesome thoughts. We need to understand the world. We need to have a wholesome, a pure reason worldview. Now, a lot of us go through life with misconceptions about the, the world we live in. We think that everything's going to come up roses for us because of our good looks or our winning personality or whatever, and that's just not necessarily the case. So I want to, I want to give you three ways today that we can, sh we can change our way of thinking to wholesome thoughts. Three ways that we can change the way we deal with the world. Okay. First of all, let the word shape your thoughts. Now notice that's word and not world. And we're going to talk about the differences here in a minute. Second Peter 3, 2 says, I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord Savior through your apostles. Okay? Uh, the words holy prophet refers to the Old Testament. The apostles were in the New Testament. The command given by our Lord and Savior, the oral tradition, the way were the things that were passed down through Christianity. Peter is saying this, and I kind of boil it down for you here. Do you want to develop wholesome thoughts? Let these words shape your thoughts. Learn to think like the prophets thought. Look at life the way Jesus taught us to. Live the way the apostles teach us to live. And that is great advice. Don't let the world shape your thinking. And I, I tell you, I see that a lot in Christianity today. When I see... I see pastors and, and Christians who rely more on what the world says and the world's worldview, and they let the world's view shape their view of Christianity. They let the world 
and its politics and its ideas shape what believers should think. That, that doesn't work. So let me, let me give you some examples, okay? First of all, the Word teaches that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. That's what the world says. But the Word teaches that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and there is salvation in no one but Him. There aren't many roads to heaven. There's one, and His name is Jesus. You say, oh, well, that's, that's very uh, uh, narrow-minded of you, Jerry. I didn't make the rules. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Next, the world teaches that truth changes from culture to culture and generation to generation. But the Word teaches that truth transcends time and place and is determined by God, not by popular opinion. Boy, and that is a big thing to think about right now. Truth is not shaped by popular opinion. If something was wrong in Bible days, it's wrong today. The world teaches that what's true for you isn't necessarily true for me. The Word teaches that we're equally responsible and subject to the law of God. Now, are there places in the Bible where we work out our own salvation? Absolutely. God may think that something that you do is a sin, and it may not be a sin for me because God deals with us differently. By the same token, I may have a sin, and you may not have that sin. Okay, that's the way that works. The, word, the world teaches, don't get mad, get even. But the Word teaches us to forgive our enemies and do good to those who harm you. Wouldn't you really have rather I skip that one? The world teaches us, look out for number one. In other words, look out for yourself. But the Word teaches us to look out for those who can't look out for themselves. See the contrast between what the world thinks and what God thinks? And boy, let me tell you something. You're going to be judged not by what the world says, but what, by what God says. So you better get this right. You better get this square in your head. The Word of God teaches us how to view the world, how to understand the difference between right and wrong, good and bad, truth and error. And don't ever forget that. You want to know if something's right or wrong? Go to the Word. You want to know if something's truth or error? Go to the Word. That's your guide. That's what God's going to judge you by. He's not going to judge you by what the world said. He's going to judge you by what His Word says. The Word, the Word, almost said world, the Word will teach us to become wholesome thinkers. And that's why Peter said, hey, remember what the prophet said, remember what the apostle said, live by that. Second thing, be skeptical. It's early. Be skeptical about the skeptics. Second Peter 3, 3 and 4. First of all, you must understand that in the last day, scoffers will come. Scoffing and following their own evil desires, they'll say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, Everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Look, Peter said, they're going to be people who scoff. They're going to be people who think that you're an idiot for being a Christian. And, oh, what? what you, the great spaghetti monster. That's, that's their big one now. The great spaghetti monster. You know what? Shut up. I'll take my chances with God. You can, go ha- you can go worry about whether there's a great spaghetti monster or something like that. And they're going to do that. They're going to make fun of you because you're a Christian. But the problem with the, way, the wor- world's way of thinking is that skeptics, by nature being skeptical, seem to know what they're talking about. I don't read reviews of movies before I go see them because I, I never agree with the skeptic. I never agree with the critic. Critic will talk about, this is the worst movie ever made. I'll get to it and I think... This is a great movie. But see, I went to be entertained. The, 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 the critic or the skeptic went to go see what's wrong with it. It's a whole different worldview. Political pundits. Oh, you know, CNN, when Trump's in office, oh, he's the worst president ever. Now Biden's in office, oh, he's the best president ever. Fox News, when, when, when Trump was in office, oh, he's the best ever. Now Biden's in office, oh, he's the worst ever. You know what? scoffers have a way of ridiculing hope. And I don't care who's president. I want them to do a good job for the country. And Peter uses an interesting phrase in the scripture we just read. He says they deliberately forget that some things are true. 
And there are none so blind as those who will not see. They deliberately ignore the small voice, the, the, the pleading of the Holy Spirit that's calling them to a personal relationship with God. They deliberately resist His voice. They don't want to hear it. Their rejection is not the result of honest intellectual inquiry, but as Peter says, following their own evil desires. I mentioned it Sunday in my message. There are some people who refuse to seek God because they don't want to quit living the way they're living. They know it's wrong. They know it's hurting them. They don't care. They want to live in sin, and so they reject God. To develop a wholesome worldview, you can't take the scoffer seriously. You can't seriously be caught up in what these knuckleheads say. You just can't. Thirdly, see every day as a gift of mercy. I love this. 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9. Do not forget one thing, This, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And then in verse five, verse 15, he follows up and says, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Wow. The promise that Peter's talking about is the second coming of Christ. He's saying God isn't slow, he's patient. He's giving you one more day. Have you ever wondered how many people convert to Christianity every day? I couldn't find it, but I did find this. I thought it was interesting. In Africa alone, one adult conservative Christian, uh, I've written this wrong. One, in Africa alone, adult conservative Christians increase at the rate of 16,173 per day. On that continent, the continent of Africa alone, every day that Jesus waits to come back, it's more than 16,000 people come to Christ and come to the knowledge of him and are saved and are going to heaven instead of hell. Every hour changes the destiny of 673 people. Every minute changes the lives of 28 people. So if Jesus wants to wait a little while longer and, 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 and your loved ones come to Christ, and that, remember those stats are just Africa. If... If Christ wants to wait and, and another 16,000 are saved and your family's one of them, it's worth it. Every single day is a gift of mercy, not just for them, but for you as well. God's given us all one more day so that we might have one more chance to repent and come to him. He's given us, you and me, one more day so we'll have one more chance to praise him. If you're already a Christian, he's given you one more day to praise him. One more day to do good works. One more chance to serve Him faithfully. One more chance to accomplish good for the purpose of His kingdom and the glory of His name. Every minute Jesus waits is something good for us. Think about it. Think about it. You have today. You can do something great for God. Some of you might say, but, but I've squandered a lifetime. I've wasted every good opportunity that came my way you have today. You may not have tomorrow, I don't know, but you have today. You can do something today that's good for the glory of his name. You can do something today that is good for someone else. You can do something today that gives him praise and honor and glory. Quit worrying about what you haven't done and worry about today. What are you gonna to do today? Keep this in mind also. Since God is patient with the human race, we need to be also. Ow. He keeps extending the calendar one more day to give everyone one more chance to make things right. So let's do the same with the people we, we love and the people we know. No matter how lost or hopeless you think your family are, or you think a person is, the calendar has been extended one more day and it could be their day for mercy. But you've got to show them mercy first. No matter how many times they've disappointed you in the past, keep the door open one more day. You've got today. Every day that you're alive is a gift of mercy from God to you. Share that gift with other people. Extend mercy to the rest of the world. Now, Paul wrote 
this letter, this letter that we call Second Peter, so that believers could learn to think wholesomely, so they could develop pure reason. This purity of thought, this right way of thinking, is necessary in order for us to act and react to life, to live real life. In order to live in the world, you got to understand it. You got to understand that there are going to be skeptics. You got to understand that God may be waiting because there's one more day of mercy. We need to see the world as the word sees it, not as the world sees it. Try saying world and word so often. It's it's very confusing. The word of God, let us shape you. Let us shape your thoughts. Let us shape your heart. Let us shape your mind. Let the skeptics say what they're going to say. I'll stick with God. We stand on the word of God. We celebrate every single day as a gift of mercy from our loving Father in heaven, and we share that mercy with the world around us. That's good stuff. That's that's an amazing opportunity for us. So, you've got today. What are you going to do with it? All right, we've got one more study in 2 Peter. That's next week. Then I'm going to take off until February or so, February probably, because uh, we're going to be traveling so fast through January that I'm not going to have, to, won't have time to stop and do a podcast and prepare one. So, um, so this, so next week will be our last time in Second Peter um, for for the year, and then my final Sunday at Remnant is coming up on January 9th. Uh, hope you all be there in person. Don't don't watch. I'd love to. Give y'all a hug before I get out of here or, or maybe a socially distant wave, but I'd love to see you January 9th. So um, I'm going to have fun getting some, some stuff together right now and hoping that it all comes together. So uh, we'll see you next week and God bless you.